So my name is Nick Kafka. I'm the CEO and founder of Teach a Man to Fish. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization on a mission to give young people uh, the skills uh, to succeed in work and life. Um, we do this through helping schools to start sustainable, profitable, educational school businesses, which are both a learning platform and a source of income. And I guess I first came across James uh, as part of our interest in sustainable models of education. Certainly, James's model is uh, as sustainable as they come. So let me tell you a little bit about James, just in case you, you haven't come across the godfather of low-cost, affordable schools before. Uh, James wears a number of hats. He's uh, an accomplished academic, a professor at the University of Newcastle for, for many years. He, he's an accomplished author of many books, including The, uh, the Beautiful Tree. Um, he is uh, also an entrepreneur. His chain of low-cost private schools, Omega, which we'll hear much more about in Ghana, uh, have been growing rapidly and catching a lot of attention and the imagination of the world as a new model for providing impactful, non-government education to young people in a sustainable way. And he's also an industry build builder. While some just focus on their, uh, their own activities, their own enterprises, he's provided you know, much of the inspiration and the support for what really has become a global movement uh, and has a number of network support organizations in the countries where low-cost schools are, are gaining the most traction. Um, of course, with this track record, he, he's uh, won many prizes over the years, uh, both for his book, The Beautiful Tree, the um, uh, Sir Anthony Fisher Memorial Prize, uh, and also as the Gold Prize winner for the IFC Financial Times uh, Private Sector Development Research Paper Award, which really opened up um, the world to this area that otherwise had been much neglected. Uh, Philanthropy Magazine has described him as a 21st century Indiana Jones, someone who uh, travels to the remotest regions of the earth researching something that many regard as mystical. So uh, I'd like to welcome James and give him this chance to tell us more about this mystical world. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So what is it that's mystical? It, it's low-cost private schools. So bef the year 2000, I, I was, I'd become an expert on private education. But as everyone knew at that time, private education is about the elites, private education is about the upper middle classes. And I felt dissatisfied with being an expert on private education for the rich. For whatever reason, I'd felt my, um, my calling, if you like, was to serve the poor. I, for whatever reason, I felt that. And here I was, an expert on private education. So how, how was that going to fit? So I, in the year 2000, I was in India. Uh, I was on a consultancy for the International Finance Corporation. They asked me to look at the Indian School of Business, now one of the top business schools in the world, Triple IT, which is now a, a top information technology uh, university. And that was great, it was interesting, but not what I felt I should be doing. So on one of my days off, I went into the slums of the old city in Hyderabad and wandered into down an alleyway and found what this mystical thing people were talking about, a private school private school, in those days charging the equivalent of one US dollar a month. And then I found another one, and another one, and soon realized there was something extraordinarily exciting going on here. Private schools for the poor, for the masses, affordable by parents, something really that I felt my life was complete then. And ever since then, I mean, I've been looking at this phenomenon around the world, finding these schools in slums and poor areas across Africa, across other parts of South Asia, celebrating their existence, studying them, exploring them in whatever ways I could. Fantastic. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know, why it is that this model actually works. I, I mean, it, it's often highlighted that teachers are exceptionally badly paid, facilities aren't always great, um, and they're often not even qualified, and yet it, somehow something important is going on here. How, how can that happen in that context? Yes. So, so, so uh, when I first discovered these, as it were, um, no one, it's, it's quite hard to believe this now because lots of you will know about low cost private schools, but in those days, no one acknowledged their existence. No one thought they, they existed even. I used to go, I, was, I remember vividly going into the slums in Lagos 
um, in Nigeria, finding school after school. Um, and then our research showed about 75% of children in poor areas were in these private schools. And then going to the Ministry of Education there, and they flatly denied the existence of these schools. And then going into the Department for International Development, again, flat denial that anything like this existed. But then I would take these officials, I would take them to the slums, and they would see these schools and realize something extraordinary was going on. So then people could no longer deny the existence of these schools. But then they started denying the significance. And this is coming around to answer your question. They denied their significance because they would say, look, the buildings are not great. Look, the, um, the teachers, they're unqualified. Uh, so, so how can they be a possible solution for education for all? And, and so that's when we started, uh, I started doing really detailed research. First of all, uh, answering, trying to answer three questions, really. First of all, how many children are in these schools? That, that was very important for me. How many children are there? And what proportion of children are there? It seemed like the majority would we find that answer, answer out? Secondly, how good are they? The, the officials, the, the, the aid experts, the international development experts all said these schools, they can't be any good. Look at them there, poor buildings, unqualified teachers, as you say, they can't be any good. So we were trying to find out academically how they compare with the government schools. And then finally, what was their business model? Initially, when you see the first or the second of these schools, you think they must be philanthropic. They must be charities. They must be people, you know, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts, opening a school for the poor. But then when you see your 50th or your 100th of these schools, you recognize there must be something else going on. So I was very interested in the business model. And in answer to the critics, I mean, the first, the first issue, quite extraordinary. In urban South Asia, in urban sub-Saharan Africa, the vast majority of children are in these low-cost private schools. 65, 75% of children are in these schools. Huge numbers of these schools. Probably 12,000 low-cost private schools in Lagos alone, Lagos State, Nigeria alone. Seven or 8,000 in rural Kenya. Extraordinary phenomenon. And in India, maybe at least 300,000 low-cost private schools. In urban areas, the vast majority in rural India, a quarter or a third, uh, a thir sorry, 31% of these children are now, uh, uh, our children are in low-cost private schools. They are outperforming government schools. We've tested so many children now. Other people have come in now. These private schools are outperforming government schools, even after controlling for background variables and selectivity biases. And they have a sustainable business model. This was really exciting to me, that they clearly are sustainable. So many schools wouldn't be there if they weren't sustainable but they are sustainable, they can make modest surpluses, modest profits which allow them to grow and, and serve even more children. So a, a tremendous success story. I mean, I've been, yeah. I've been celebrating this ever since. You know, I wrote that book, The Beautiful Tree, um, to celebrate the existence of these schools. And ever since then, I've been trying to combat the critics, like you were saying, and trying to, to really focus attention on the sector and how it can be developed even further. So I think it's, you know, clear from those who look at your research, you know, these schools are, despite the circumstances, managing to uh, have a great impact and do a better job in, you know, in the majority of cases than, than many of the less well-run government schools. I just thought it might be interesting to drill down into, you know, why that magic happens. You know, how is it that actually the school outperforms? Is it, well, I'll leave it up to you to provide the explanation. Yes, and, and obviously we don't know the answer to this, but if you, go to the, if you go to parents, first of all, this is, the exciting thing about this is um, there's, there's this grassroots privatization taking place. The, the poor, if you like, are privatizing education themselves. No government has decided this. The poor are, are doing it themselves. And what will parents say? So we, I've interviewed, I've talked to so many parents. They will say, first of all, that in the government schools, which is the alternative, government schools are everywhere available in these places. Our children are abandoned, they will say. And what does that mean? That the teachers don't turn up, mm -hmm. or if they do turn up, they don't teach, or if they do teach, they don't teach intensely. I mean, you, there's story after story of how these government schools are, are not conducive for the poor. Um, I, I've just heard about a story in Tanzania, for instance, where the children come in on, this is to the government school, the public school, 
They come in on a Saturday for extra classes. Why do they do that? Well, because the teachers only half-heartedly teach during the week, and they make the children come in and have to pay to come in on a Saturday. And talking to the children, well, what's your incentive for coming in on a Saturday? Um, you know, perhaps asking ho that question, hopefully you'll hear a positive answer. The, teacher, uh, the children say, if we don't pay and come in on a Saturday, we get beaten on a Monday. Now, that sort of story, that sort of story is commonplace. And once you see that time and time again, you get a sense that the accountability is not there in the government schools. The accountability is there in the private schools. And parents see that with crystal clarity. They can see they want their children to go to a private school where teachers are accountable to the owner. The owner is accountable to the parents because the margins are very tight in these schools. If you start losing children, then you will, you'll go out of business. So all the incentives seem to be in the right direction, I think, uh, Nick. Fantastic. Mm. And I guess, uh, you know, whilst there are, you know, many university professors and academics out there who observe the world and say, you know, this is a problem, this is a solution, I've done some research and, uh, and shout about it, you know, there aren't many who then take on the personal responsibility to do something about it, become an entrepreneur and actually go out there and set up their own thing. So that, that's one of the things that I think is a bit remarkable about you and uh, I would love it if you could share a bit with... Uh, the audience today, yeah. you know, the, some of the background to you setting up these schools, the challenges, why you took it upon yourself to do that. Yes. I, I mean, Nick, I, I often feel like a, a jack of all trades, master of none. You know, I, I, I do wear these different hats, and one is the hat of the academic. I go there, I, I've been researching these schools, and I've, I've tried to publicize their existence and champion their existence. Um, but the second hat I wear is this, this, this person who wants to celebrate these schools. I, once you go into these schools and see the, the parents who would otherwise not have the same hope coming into the low-cost private schools, and, 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 and I, I want to celebrate them. So I've celebrated in various ways the book. Um, the, uh, I've set up or helped set up various federations around the world. There's, one which I'm involved with, I'm the patron of one in Nigeria. It's got this wonderful Nigerian name, the Association of Formidable Education Development. Um, and I, I'm involved in others, NISA in India, I'm the chief mentor there, in Sierra Leone, South Sudan, Liberia. I've helped create associations to help celebrate what's going on and improve what's going on. But then you also said, I've, I've set up some schools myself. So in, in around 2008, 2007, uh, I won that prize you mentioned. Um, oh, 2006 it was. Yeah, 2006 I won the IFC FT prize. And there was a, the essay I wrote, it was actually the last chapter of The Beautiful Tree, published a couple of years later. It said, the schools are better than the government schools. But anyone in those schools will tell you they can be improved. You know, let's try and further improve them. And people would tell me all the time, you're an outsider, can't you help us improve? And I, I would start saying, but I think you know, what you're doing is marvelous. But people would say, no, no, you can help us improve even more. And so one of the ideas I had in that essay was, um, why not create chains of these schools? An individual school cannot afford to invest in teacher training, research and development on itself by itself, but if you have a chain of these schools, then they can have economies of scales, they can raise investment, they can uh, really improve what's going on. And I, I wrote this there, and I, I got lots of phone calls and emails. One was from a certain Jay Kilman, you may have heard about, uh, who, who came to see me in Newcastle University, excited by this idea of the chain, and then went on to found Bridge International in, in Kenya, now the fastest growing there. Um, someone else came and see me, and I, I went to India to start stuff for a, mo for a while. India's a very difficult market to crack. We can talk about it in the Q&A. The regulations there are so heavy. So then I was really, I had one of those serendipitous um, emails from a, a, a man called Ken Donko, a young Ghanaian entrepreneur who was excited about the model. And he'd, um, for his MBA, he'd written something about this model, and he... He came to visit me in India, then I went to Ghana. We couldn't find any investor, so I committed myself to that project. I put my own money in, and we founded, together we founded Omega Schools. And uh, that's, that grew very rapidly. In, in, I think it was actually four and a half, five years it grew from zero to 40 schools, nearly 20,000 children enrolled. And 
It was a wonderful experience creating something like that with Ken Donko, brilliant entrepreneur, um, creating something that we could see was incrementally better than anything that was available. Mm -hmm. Any, anything else was available there. Um, we, we, we got independent research to show that it was better than the other private schools, certainly better than the government schools. But building that, building it from scratch, and uh, facing so many challenges, but really feeling quite satisfied in the end that we'd created something that was showing the way, I think, to that you could bring far, uh, you know, big investment in to create a chain that actually would improve the conditions of the poor um, substantially. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I guess as, as this is labelled a meet the mentor or a lunch, uh, you know, yeah. may, maybe it might be interesting to have a few words of wisdom. You know, if there are people <laughs> out in the audience who might be thinking of setting up their own low-cost private school chain, you know, what, what would you tell them they should be doing or the most important things? Uh, and what, what would be the, the, the hard-learned lessons you have yeah. to, uh, to avoid? Yeah, I, I read it was the meet the mentor lunch. I'm still looking forward to meeting him. <laughs> you know, um, uh, no, it's, uh, the... Um, it's both harder than you think and it's easier than you think. If anyone is interested in this idea of the chain of low-cost private schools, um, the, the easier thing than, than you might think is the capital requirements are not huge. Okay, now, in Omega schools, we, we actually buy the land and build, build the buildings, but we were doing it in a suitably low-cost manner. You know, um, in, in Africa, you've got to be very, very careful of to avoid paying the, uh, the white man's prices, the foreigner's prices. You know. So we did it in a very, very cost-effective manner. And initially, we were building schools for $50,000 each. Now, perhaps they're seventy-five dollars to $100,000. But the, so the capital is not huge. The capital is not huge. And in fact, it's better if you have little capital, because then you don't fall into the trap of building massive overheads that later then you've got to you've got to um, support through your operation. I mean, because it was my money, and my money alone initially, well, we had one or two other little bits come in, but mostly my money, um, I, I, was, I was so careful about every, every penny, every yeah. uh, peswa, every Ghanaian CD that was spent. I remember going into one of our first schools, and um, we were drinking out of plastic cups from a beaker, and I had a plastic cup in the morning, and then they gave me a different new plastic cup in the afternoon. I said, well, what's wrong with that one we had this morning? We can't just be wasting plastic cups like this. You've got to be really careful. And, and that would be a very general lesson. Keep your overheads low, um, be lean, and try and keep this you know, really confined. But once you, if, you, if you do that, if you get, instill that discipline, then the sky is, is your limit. And always focus on the kids, focus on education, focus on something that drives us all, I know, that, that passion for education, and well, you, you can't go far wrong, yeah. Okay. Mm. And maybe following on from that, if you had to draw out some of the differences, uh, I mean, you know, for many of us who aren't able to actually go and visit these schools, we hear Omega banded around, we hear Bridge Academies banded around, there, there are these various chains. You know, maybe be interesting within the world of low-cost private schools if you could explain a bit how you view the distinctions between the, the different approaches people have taken and, and which ones you believe are, are more likely to be successful and the various merits and demerits. Yeah. Well, I know um, Omega Schools is successful. Omega Schools has, um, we, we've reached break-even, we're a sustainable business now, and uh, we've got the luxury, the huge luxury of having a very patient investor, Caitlin Donnelly is representing Pearson Affordable Learning Fund. They're very patient. They recognize that uh, you know, there will be teething problems with this very new innovation of a chain of low-cost private schools. But we are in a position where, for the last two years or one and a half years, we uh, basically we said, let's not grow anymore. We've grown very rapidly to 40 schools. Let's consolidate. Let's bring quality uniformly high across the chain and then we'll expand later. We want to expand because we want to reach more children with a model that's, that's good, but we don't have investors breathing down our necks to sort of push us in any direction. I mean, I'm, you mentioned Bridge International Academies. I'm full of admiration for Jake Kilmerman. When he came to visit me in Newcastle, I was very excited by the guy. I've, every time I see him and meet him, I feel excited by him and his energy and his vision. Um, their, their model is 
is growing rapidly, as you all know. I think they've got 120 or more, 120,000 children. Their break-even is, is beyond that, so they've still got to, to move that way. But I wish them well, and it would be great to have them um, a successful model to show the way to. So there are others. There are other ones. I mean, I've started a couple of other little ones. Which we, There's one in Sierra Leone I've started or co-founded. I'm working with someone in Honduras to create a new chain there. And I'm working in India as well. Um, my, my preference, and it was always our preference with Omega. Other people see the world differently. But um, to use the cricketing analogy, um, and it's probably a baseball analogy too, <laughs> we, it's best to get runs on the board first before you start um, talking and shouting about it. I mean, I, I didn't want any publicity about Omega until we were comfortable we had something worth showing. I still don't like a lot of publicity, to be honest about mm -hmm. it. Um, I prefer, because it's not, it's not good enough. You know, as an educator, we're all, a lot of us are educators here. I mean, it's not good enough. You know, it's very, I said it's quite easy to do earlier on, but it's very hard to get consistent educational quality of the sort that you and I would desire. So I'd rather get the quality even better before we start shouting about it. Um, but yeah, so there are chains there, some, some you might not know about. Correct. There are a couple that, uh, that um, don't mind the limelight. Others perhaps are waiting till they're really in a position to, 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 uh, to show an amazing model. Yeah. Fantastic, mm. and uh, I guess you know. I've, ever since I came across it, I've been a, a fan of the, the low-cost private school model for mm. at least for being sustainable, for filling that chunk of education that, that otherwise might not be met, mm. and for doing it at a quality that is, on average, superior. It seems yeah. to uh, public education. Although wearing my sort of teacher man's fish hat. Um, yeah. You know, we, we feel that education is, is sometimes more than just what governments expect anyway, that education is about more than just learning to read and write even at primary school, uh, and that really schools have a responsibility to ensure that kids not, don't just leave with a piece of paper, but actually leave with the skills needed for success in work and life, to be able to get a job or, or where they don't have any uh, jobs to create their own job. Um, and in many cases, the, the low-cost private school agenda doesn't seem to address this. So when it comes to entrepreneurship education, skills education, soft skills, building leaders, people mm. who can work in teams, people who can communicate effectively, you know, where do you see that fitting in with the low-cost private school model? Well, it's certainly not incompatible with the model at all. And in, in Omega schools and also in Alpha schools that I, I'm, I'm looking at in Sierra Leone, um, you know, we are, we are trying to uh, uh, adapt the curriculum in ways uh, and the learning methods in ways that, um, you know, would, would, would actually be of interest to you. And obviously, we're interested in your materials and how we can adapt those too. But we, we've developed or we're developing a life skills program in Omega Schools, which will bring in entrepreneurship, um, other things that will be useful for setting up your own business, but recognizing that leadership... Um, the qualities of public speaking, of all those things, they're all very, very important. Within the, the chain, we have various competitions, right. um, which, which bring children out in many ways. We have music competitions, right. a football competition. I, it's nothing to do with me, but the football competition is called the, um, the Thule Challenge Cup. You know, oh, really? But uh, there, there you go. Um, Inter-school competition. But there's lots of ways of bringing out leadership within the schools. But we don't do enough. Absolutely, we don't do enough. I want to do more. And the really, about developing life skills, the really interesting thing is we are, we are a business. We have computer labs. We, have, we outsource the kitchen. Right. So we, we serve a daily lunch, we outsource the kitchen to local women, uh, and you've got various businesses that they're operating. So the, the ideas that we've had is to try and get the kids to say, okay, if they were running the kitchen for a week, you know, how, how could they do this? How could do, they do this more cheaply than we do it right. or more efficiently? Within the community, I mean, in Ghana, as in lots of West Africa, um, there's a big informal community. Um, economy. So there's lots of small informal businesses around. So we've got the kids to say, well, what is the business model, the financial model for the, um, the, the market trader, you know, the, the, the fisherman? The, um, the, it, across Accra, as you know, there are all these um, informal 
um, what do you call them, uh, trotros, right. the, the taxis. I'd love to know what the business model there is. You basically, a, it's a two-man job. Uh, one guy is called the um, scout. He's the one who opens the door, shouts out, gets people in, another driver, and they seem to share. What's the model there? So we can get kids thinking about these things. But we don't do enough, and I'd love, this is a way I think we can certainly interact with Teach a Man to Fish, which is an outstanding <laughs> organization, by the way. I'm full of admiration for, for Nick and all his work in this. Fabulous. Well, yeah. we'll share materials with you and, <laughs> and anyone else who's interested. Yeah. Um, and it's great to hear that because, you know, Frankly, it is a little depressing sometimes, the idea that you know, low cost just means stripping the skills out of the teachers and teaching the kids the minimum. So it's brilliant to hear that no, you're doing it, that it much more. It definitely doesn't mean that. Yeah. You know, as, as I say, we, we have the luxury in Omega that we, we have one patient investor. We don't have a lot of different audiences to satisfy. Mm -hmm. And the patient investor, I mean, Sir Michael Barb is the chairman of the fund. He is absolutely committed to children both improving educationally but improving their life opportunities mm -hmm. and absolutely we have to focus on other areas too um, so we can be flexible but I, I know we don't do it well enough we, we are we're, we're a learning organization and we we admit to our faults and shortcomings but we can we can rectify those I'm sure fabulous so I think maybe one, one last question before we open it up to the audience and mm. uh, we'll have about 15 minutes for, for your questions too mm. Mm. Um, there are some critics out there who, who consistently sort of argue against uh, low-cost private schools and say that education should be a right uh, and not a commodity. And, uh, you know, there's a quote from uh, Keith Lewin of Sussex saying, you know, every dollar households spend on school fees in, is a dollar less they spend on health, clean water, food, and shelter. So fee-paying private schools increase poverty directly. Mm -hmm. how, how do you counter those kind of critics? Well, Professor Keith Lewin is obviously a dear friend of mine and... Uh, I would um, just say to him, you're completely and utterly wrong in everything <laughs> you, you say and believe. And, um, but, but seriously, and I hope some people will come back to me. I'm looking at John Bangs, for example, and others will come back to me in, in the Q&A about this. But, but, but let, we're in the real world, okay? So whatever your, your idea is about what reality should be like, a lot of critics like Keith Lewin and... and he has this ideal of a perfectly egalitarian, properly function government education system. And if you can make that work and satisfy everyone, then first of all, you'll put all these private schools out of business, you'll put me out of business, I'll completely shut up, I'll never say another word about private schools. So if you get that system, fine. The reality in the developing world is not that. The reality is that system where government schools are not working well. Another example, I was with Hector Soda in a fishing village called Sika, where we, we talked to the fishermen who were using, I think this, this was a government-aided school, and uh, one, one father told me a story I'll never, ever forget. He said, the quality is so low there, we, everyone agreed that, the quality is so low there that one day this fisherman went to complain at the school. And you can see it through the teacher's eyes, they're from the city, they're not, they're, they're posh, they're whatever this dirty, illiterate, smelly fisherman came. They phoned the police and had him arrested for abusing them. He was thrown in prison. If you get in prison in India, it's quite hard to get out. This poor guy. That's the sort of thing that goes on in these government schools. It's not. So that's the reality. With that reality, I say to Keith, you look a poor parent in the eye, and you say to that parent, you cannot go to that private school where 95% of you incidentally want to go, which is affordable to you even, you know, we've done a lot of work on this, affordable to you on the poverty line. You can't go there because by going there, you are distorting the government system. So you've got to go to that system where your kids get beaten on a Monday if they don't come and pay fees to the teachers on a Saturday, where the teachers don't turn up, or where they're going to arrest the father who comes to ever put in a quality control complaint. If Keith Lewin can do that and look parents in the eyes, well, then, then I'll take my hat off to him. But my sense is most of us can't. My, my sense is most of us will say in the real world, education may or may not, you know, it's, it's a right. It's something that we all value. We're all here, gathered here because we value it. In the real world, the private school is the best option for those kids. And in answer to the question, what about those left behind in the government schools? My view is let's release them from the government schools. Let's get the Varki Foundation and others to give scholarships. We can do them very low cost to get them across into schools like Omega. You can transfer the kids across and until, let the government system sort itself out. But until then, the private sector is the way forward. I genuinely believe that. I genuinely believe, I know Keith very well. I know he holds those views 
Um, he, he's not, you know, he does them, uh, 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 what's the word, um, you know, genuinely, they're genuinely held values and beliefs, but I think he's really wrong there. Fantastic. Well, that seems a perfect opportunity to uh, open things out to the audience. Uh, please show your appreciation for uh, James so far. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to a, a lively debate. So uh, is there, there's a question over there. Can you see who they are? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you can say who you are in your organization, that'd be great. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah McLean. I work for Gems World Academy Abu Dhabi. Um, and I'm inclined to completely agree with you mm. about the private sector and the need for it and the importance of having options but I have to disagree about the government schools. Um, I do see their importance, and I wonder um, what kind of tangible options there are for people that realistically can't go to a private school. And saying let's release them from the government school doesn't address the issues that are obviously occurring within them. So any solutions yeah. for that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm a completely free agent, and I can say, what I see about government schools, and I'm sure in Abu Dhabi they're better, but actually probably not that much better because that's why they give contracts to GEMS to run them, you know, because <laughs> they, they're not satisfied with what's happening there. But, you know, uh, that, and there will be, I, I mean, I'm never, never ever criticizing government teachers who go into that system. You know, you get a lot of young people go into that system, committed, want to improve it, and then get slammed shut by that culture of indifference to the kids. It's, I've met teachers like that, it's just heartbreaking, you know, because they, people want to sometimes go and change the world and they, they get slammed by the, by the culture. But I, I thought I answered your question in my last comment. Maybe I was um, thinking I, I, I said it clearer than I, if there are kids stuck in government schools and that's a problem to you, which is a problem to me, kids out of school, kids stuck in government schools, then some sort of targeted scholarship, targeted voucher for those kids to help them go to a private school. Is, is, is an answer, isn't it? But surely you can't offer scholarships to all those children Why not? in a government school. Well, so first of all, the government is paying for all those kids in the government school. And, and in many of these countries, the governments, you know, they're not short of funds. And the, the, the funds to pay for a government school are many multiples of the funds to pay for a private school. I mean, a recent survey in India suggested a government school place costs three times more than a private school place, even though the private schools are better and more effective. And in, in Africa, it's at least that, I think. So, you know, you can get three times as many kids who are in the government schools, three times as many places in the private schools. So it can be done. Now, I know no one's going to countenance that. I know no one is going to countenance that. But, but that is, if the problem, well, and the second solution is to improve the government schools. Yeah, and well, it does address the big issue because parents are choosing to go to private schools and those private schools are better and they're serving them well and there's a scholarship mechanism which can get them there. But I'm very happy for people to improve the government schools. The good news is, for people who hold that sort of view, the good news is, um, until very recently, I was in a minority of one who was speaking in favor of focusing on the private schools to improve. 99.99% of people interested in development and education were trying to support the... Um, the public schools, the government schools. Now I'm probably in a minority of, well, there's a few of us working in this space. But most people are still focused on the government schools, and most people, well, are they succeeding or not? I don't know. Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, I think a lot, lots of other questions to come. So the gentleman over there, and then we have some at the front table as well. Yes, hi. My name is Marcelo Perez Alfaro, and I am from the, from the Inter-American Development Bank. I have, a, I have two short questions. First one, which is the main characteristics of the of the uh, principles that leads this mm. uh, type of schools? And the second question is, could this model work under a public-private uh, uh, partnership mm. yeah. scheme in yeah. which you have public f uh, funding? but uh, privately operated yeah. schools. Yeah, okay. So the, the, the first question, there are now many people coming into this, this market, but when I, when I first was discovering this <laughs> thing for myself and telling people about it, there, there were probably three types of, so not principals, but entrepreneurs who were building these schools. And some, of course, are church schools, mosque schools, and NGO schools. So there are those schools as well. 
which are also in the sector. But they, the ones owned by proprietors, often you would find a mother who's got a couple of kids of her own, and she then brings a few other kids in to sort of build a creche or a nursery. And then the parents say, well, our kids are happy with you. you know, grade one can't be that different from what you're doing. And a school is grown from the bottom up then you'd often get uh, typically a young, young man, a younger man who's running a cramming class, a tutorial class for older children for exams. They would say, we're learning more with you than we are in the school. Can you start a school and a school be grown from the top down, as it were? But then a lot of people are seeing that running schools in the sort of markets I'm describing, running schools is a, a reasonable living. You know? So now you get lots of different people coming into the sector who who just see that running a school is something good to do, it's something valued in the community, and, and so, so you've got a whole range, in other words. But mostly, I mean, 99% from the communities, the poorer communities themselves, they are running the schools. The second question was, can you do this having public-private partnerships? Well, Sir Michael Barber is doing this very effectively in, um, in Pakistan, in um, Punjab, in Pakistan, and I've yet to see the model, but I think it's a very exciting model where you have got public money coming into the private schools, sort of a, almost like a universal voucher system I was describing earlier. Um, I, I am always a little bit wary of this because if you can't control the public teachers, then it's going to be very difficult if you haven't got... You know, if you haven't got that accountability relationship, it's probably going to be difficult to run this. But apparently it's working in different places. Um, I'm, you know, I'm excited by the potential. Fantastic. I think the lady over here has been waiting a little John while. Bangs behind. And John behind. Okay, right. James, um, my name is Ramya, and uh, uh, I've actually spent uh, several years and days and nights trying to reform the government school system and uh, with a little bit of uh, with a little bit of progress, mm, and uh, and I think at, at the height of frustration was when I read the beautiful tree. So completely resonate with everything that you're saying. Uh, the question for you is um, uh, building on this public-private partnership. The, the reality in a lot of our countries is that regulations are uh, clamping down on low-cost private schools in a yes. in a big way. And uh, there are many of us trying to figure out what can be uh, ways around these regulations. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but that is happening. In India, we've had some 4,000 of these schools shut down and so on. Mm -hmm. So can uh, a, a mod ha have you seen a, a model of public-private partnership or, or alternative policy that can allow low-cost private schools to function as long as they meet certain quality outcome parameters rather than meeting certain infrastructure yeah. or qualification norms, yeah. and uh, have you actually seen that uh, yeah. working somewhere? Yeah. So, so the, the regulatory environments for, for private schools vary across countries. I, I, I'm very pleased to tell you that the Ghana um, environment is very conducive to, to private investment in private schools. Um, other countries is less conducive. And India, India is a real... Yeah, it's really difficult. So they've got the Right to Education Act. The Right to Education Act sounds like it's the right thing, doesn't it? It sounds like it's a good thing. But they've created, the, I, I guess um, the NCRT, whoever it is, created norms for the Right to Education Act. And I think universally, I, I mean, the norms are all about inputs. So they're all saying you've got to have a playground of a certain size, your teachers have got to be qualified and paid a certain amount, you've got to have a certain... You know, all inputs. And almost by definition, these inputs rule out a lot of the low-cost private schools. So you've got this terrible situation. Punjab now in India, I think Andhra Pradesh in India, um, Haryana, I think has recently has been a court case which has been successful here, but across different parts of India, you've had thousands of these low-cost private schools closed. And just picture this scene. You've got parents... You know, I've told you one anecdote about the, the guy who went to complain and was imprisoned. I've told you other anecdotes there. So parents have chosen not to send their children to the government schools. They've, they've said, this is not good enough for my child. They've sent their child to a private school. So they had their eyes open. They, there was an alternative. They sent them to a private school. And now government officials are coming along and closing those private schools and sending the kids back to government schools. 
And there's some quite interesting work being done by various organizations, Center for Civil Society in India, the India Institute, showing how the conditions are much worse in the government schools than they were in the private schools that are now being closed. So it's, it's a real headache, the situation in India, because you're based on these inputs. But my understanding is the state of Gujarat does have, in India, does have um, some allowance or potentially some way of having outcome-based criteria. Now, if that works, that's fantastic. But, you know, that there are organizations working around the world. Grey Matters Capital has created an organization rating schools. That's a good way of looking at outcomes. Acer has got outcome-based um, ways of looking at the world. It would be terrific if you had that. You know, you, if you want regulation, you've got to have it based on outcomes, not on inputs. But I, I, I'm, a bit, I'm a little bit pessimistic. I know the theme of this conference is optimism, and generally I'm very optimistic about um, the potential of this sector. But India does break my heart a little bit. I spoke to an official rep in, in Punjab um, over the telephone, and um, he, uh, he said to me, oh, you foreigners, you get misled by India. India's a very big country. We've only closed, two, in those days, 2,000 schools. I said, 2,000 schools is 400,000 students. He said, it's a big country. Yeah. You know, I just thought, well, that's just an intolerable <laughs> attitude. And of course, his children go to a private school. University officials send their children to private schools. So John, wow. OK, uh, yeah, John at the back, could we get a, a microphone there? Is it OK? Oh, just the back table. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jorge Jesuski. I am from Peru, and I am involved in a project that tried to build a hundred schools, private school, low cost school. Uh, right now, we are operating 29 schools with almost 20,000 students. Mm. And as you know, one of the main costs in the, uh, the school is the salary of the teachers. Mm. And if you are a low cost school, you can pay high salary. You can't, no. Y yes, you can't. No. And what are they doing, the other chains in the world, in order to recruit a good teachers, but with low salaries? Yeah. And, and are you, so, so this is one of these chains we don't know about. It sounds great. I'd love to follow up with you afterwards. But are you, are you covering your costs through the fees, or are you also subsidized from outside? No, we are a private company. Yeah. OK, and we are not receiving Wonderful. Any so, so here's exactly what we were describing earlier. A chain of schools developing there, under the radar, doing something, and we're really excited to meet you, and I'd like to catch up afterwards. But, I mean, the, the way we do it, the, the low-cost private school model depends on teachers from the communities who are not um, paid at the government rates. It absolutely depends on it. If you start paying the government, uh, the teachers at the government rate, then you can't have low fees. You have to be subsidized. The whole model breaks down. But what we try and do, and what we're trying to do for these federations, I told you, remember we created these, I've worked to help create these federations and also the chain of schools. We are trying to think, okay, a fully trained teacher, what does a fully trained teacher have? A fully trained teacher has the ability to create lesson plans has the ability to um, create assessments. Assessment is a much more difficult task than most people understand. It's very difficult. They, have, they can create uh, exercises for the children and so on. So these skills of a trained teacher, we bring into head office. So in Kaswa in Ghana, we have a dedicated team who's creating lesson plans, creating workbooks for the children, creating assessments. And so therefore, when we take these untrained teachers, we give them that, and in a sense, we're then saying an untrained teacher plus the facilities, plus training in the facilities, plus mentoring in the facilities, untrained plus all that, almost gives you a trained teacher. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it supplements that, so you help, you can raise those standards. So that, that's, that's the approach we take. I'd love to know what, what your approach is, too. Fabulous. Uh, yes, John, John in the back. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Nice to see you in operation again after all these years. <laughs> yeah, great to see you too, John. Good, yeah. good fun. I, I'm, I'm something I reminded when I when I last saw you uh, speak. I, I'm curious to know what gets your ideological juices going. Really. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure, 
uh, whether it's providing education, I'm pretty sure it is, in areas where there isn't quality education, or whether it's your attachment to privatisation as opposed to your ideological opposition to government, and isn't, incidentally, your view about government-run schools an ideological opposition yeah. rather than a pragmatic or practical opposition? Mm. I mean, you know, what would you do if they're all performing wonderfully in that situation? I d and the other question I'd like to know is, is let's say the staff in your, your chains come to you and say, we want to organise a union. What would you do? I mean, I, I don't know what your response would be. I mean, it, you know, they might say, actually, we, we do want a, 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 a better quality conditions. We do actually want professional development. We do want a line towards achieving qualified teacher status. How, what's your response to that? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what is getting you going. Yeah, my idea was to education. Yeah. yeah, and on the union question, obviously, I'd get them straight in touch with John Bangs from uh, <laughs> Education <laughs> International and, and uh, invite you over, and you could see for yourself a really interesting model. I'd love to take you there and also to Sierra Leone where just fantastic uh, opportunities that we're, we're working with. But ideological uses, it's very interesting. When, when you're opposed to someone and you don't like their views, you tend to call them ideological um, or partisan. And when someone agrees with you with firmly held views, you can call them philosophical or whatever. So my philosophical views, John. Um, no, I, I mean... Uh, I, I don't know if you know what I I I went to Zim, my first job was as a teacher in Zimbabwe. I went to help Robert Mugabe build this socialist regime. I used to work on co-ops. I was a young socialist. I came back to England during the Thatcher revolution. Margaret Thatcher was doing stuff with schools, so-called privatization. I started a doctorate at the Institute of Education, well known for its left-wing views. I started this doctorate because I wanted to fight Margaret Thatcher's so-called market reforms. So my e ideology was completely opposed to where I am now. I then did my doctorate, and I talked myself out of that position and came out a believer in the private sector. Okay? I mean, a believer, I'm using your sort of phrase, but I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm falling into your trap here. I came out strongly believing this was the solution. And then I go back to what I started in the beginning, it's quite unusual to have, I had this philosophical, you say ideological, belief in the private sector. And then I walk into the slums of not one country, but five, six, seven countries. I've been all over, the, I've been to Somalia, Liberia, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, I've seen this thing. I walk into the slums there, and I find this strange thing. Poor families agree with my philosophy that I picked up at the Institute of Education. And... So now, I've moved on a lot since you saw me last. I've, I've now just say, it's irrelevant what I believe. Don't even ask me that question, and please don't push me. What do I believe about the role of government education? What's interesting to me is what hundreds and thousands and millions of parents, poor parents, believe, and what they believe is the government is not good enough, and they prefer private. So... My ideological stuff is totally irrelevant now to any of this debate. Um, the poor, I use that phrase deliberately, the poor have privatized themselves. I have my own version of the Gettysburg, uh, Gettysburg Address, Privatiz privatization of education by the people, for the people. That's what's happening. Nothing to do with me. For the record, you know, my thesis, my philosophical thesis, doesn't think there's a role for government in education. I think the union it's question irrelevant. was, uh, you're, you're welcome to come and try and start a union in any of uh, James's schools. <laughs> oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. But, but the answer to the question <laughs> earlier, if the government school is successful, you know, I'm getting old and tired, and I mean, I'm, you're grey, I'm bold, you know, we're getting, you know, I mean, if the government schools are successful, I'll hang up my coat and sit back and relax, you know, and, and feel someone else is doing a job well, and I'll be very happy, because my, what, oh, so what gets my ideological juices is going is seeing poor kids get increased opportunities. That's what gets it going. And I think we've just time for and thank maybe... thank you for setting uh, me up with that question. Maybe time for one last question, I think. Um, uh, the lady over here has had her hand up longest. Hello. Thank you so much. It's, I'm so inspired. I have a quick comment and then a question. The comment is, I feel like when I moved from lo one location to another recently in Abu Dhabi, I had a house sale because it didn't I didn't want the money or need it, but I didn't want to go have to bring all the things to the charities. So I wanted people to come and take it away. 
So I charged a very, very low fee. And the people who came were mostly low-paid workers. And they were delighted to pay a dollar for something that was worth 30 that they needed, maybe mm. a chair or a pot. Yeah. Or yeah. And I think the same is true of parents. They want to pay. If you give it away, it's an insult sometimes because they want to pay what they can afford for something they value. So maybe that's the key to your success. Mm. And But I commend you to keep it small because I am a public educator. Yes. And my question is this, and I, I think it's like Socrates, there's probably no answer. But it's how do we keep the intensity out of schools? Uh, the intensity? politics, the oh, politics, politics the, yeah. You know, uh, in the end, it's about children and teachers, teachers who are people and mostly caring and ca uh, but it, there's so much, and I'm from the US, and it's the same here. There's so many people who want a piece of the pie, and so many people telling teachers and educators what they need to mm -hmm. do. Y you just become, you suffocate. Yeah, uh, yeah, OK. So on your comment, I, I told you about my uh, business partner in, in Ghana, Ken Donko, exceptional entrepreneur, but he had an anecdote where he said um, the parents used to come to him and say the government schools are worse than free. They're worse than free, you know. And, and yes, some parents do have this sense in which if they're paying for something, I mean, we all feel that sometimes it's great to come and have a free, you know, we're all, I think we're all here on a free lunch, <laughs> apart from me, of course, and you. But, you know, sometimes yeah, no we do appreciate it, but sometimes we appreciate the ability to keep something accountable if we're paying we know it's something that's accountable to us, so, so that's true. But um, on the politics, I mean, so this goes back to John's question and my, you know, my philosophical ideas, but, which I don't want to dwell on. Um, but I, um, you see, uh, my considered view is education is far too important to be left to governments because governments will create the sort of political diversions you're talking about Education becomes a political football. I mean, in my own country, we have debates about, well, for, it was grant-maintained schools the government brought in, which was bringing schools some slight autonomy. Then the Labour government came in and abolished grant-maintained schools, but they then created academies, and then the coalition government created free schools, which the next Labour government, when they come in, they'll abolish them. You know. And you just go backwards and forwards. I like the idea of education being far more important that it should be outside of the realm of politics. So. I'd be very interested in talking to you afterwards. I mean, your sort of sense of this is not right within politics, is there any other way of isolating it from yeah, politics? So yeah. I mean, I, I, you're from America, I, I think. You know, I, I, I saw some absolutely brilliant charter schools in different parts of America. And then I heard, so one of these brilliant charter schools had a waiting list, 3,000 long, a genuine waiting list. They phoned up every term to make sure they're still on there. And it applied to build a new second charter school was turned down because government said, no, you can't, you know, the, wherever it was said, no, you can't do that, you know. And, and we've all seen, or many, if you haven't seen the heartbreaking film Waiting for Superman, which is about mainly poor or disadvantaged parents on getting a lottery ticket for a charter school and then breaking down when they can't get their kid into the charter school. I, you know, people say, I'm talking about educational apartheid, private and government. Well, uh, you know, I can be consistent and say, no, I don't want an educational apartheid. I want everyone to be in the system that seems to be working better, um, which seems to be the private sector. Fantastic. Well, uh, yeah, I'd love to take more <laughs> questions, but uh, I think James is probably prepared to stay around for a little while longer. And, uh, you know, I feel I, I've been privileged to ask him some of the questions I've wanted. So please come up and talk to him afterwards. Yeah. But please first join me in giving him a large uh, round Thank of you. applause. Thank you. Thank you.